Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, everybody, for being here today. That was a nice bio, Randy. I appreciate that. Um, we'll really try to stick to the safety aspect of armor built and so forth. Um, and if you can go to the next slide, we'll just cover some agenda topics. I've got a little bit of background to share so you can clue in on what we're going to talk about here. It's about a little bit about Hexion and sustainable development, uh, introducing armor built wildfire shield, and take note of the picture on the right. That's what armor built wrapped power poles look like before they're activated or experience a wildfire, wildfire temperatures. And you're going to see something different in some of the slides uh, as we go through it with regards to what it looks like after it's activated. And it takes about <clears throat> right out about 380 degrees Fahrenheit, about around 380, 385F to activate it. It'll activate on the uh, fire front before, actually before the flames even get there in a lot of cases. Um, go over some laboratory tests and we've done. It's literally one of the extremely uh, extensively tested materials uh, out there today. And to give you an example, some of the larger utilities, uh, the bulk of which are in California, but pretty much west of the Continental Divide. But there has been right now, I checked yesterday, about 85,000 wood power poles wrapped with this. And there are other uh, market spaces we're looking at getting into and already in uh, with regards to like railroad, single family dwelling, multifamily dwellings, that kind of thing. We'll go over some installation aspects, climbing safety, service and, expect, and, and inspection, and then also a recent canyon burn uh, that we participated in uh, around Salinas in the Gallatin range. Okay, Adam, go ahead. A little bit about Hexion. It's been it's a hundred year old company. It used to be Borden Chemical, as in Gail Borden. But anyway, it morphed into Hexion. We've got twenty six production facilities uh, covering the globe, really, and about one thousand three hundred associates. Our world headquarters are in Columbus, Ohio, and you can see down below we're tickling. Well, actually, it's gone up since then. About a two billion dollar a year company. Adhesive has covered the main portion of it and then performance materials. And you can see sales by segment. We can send this to everybody. As a matter of fact, I think it already was sent. But uh, you can see some of the sub-segments we service and then the sales by geography. I guess suffice it to say, in a nutshell, Hexion makes billions and billions of pounds of adhesives for the timber industry, uh, oil field, aircraft, spacecraft, wind energy, our coatings are on the blades and towers, we're on the 787 Dreamliner rivetless uh, jet, that kind of stuff, that's our coating on there. Anyway, into a lot of different things, it's really quite a fun place to work, a lot of autonomy and room for innovation. Go ahead. Thanks, Adam. So, Axion Chemistry Enabling Sustainable Development when you think about what we're doing, it, it really is supplying enabling technologies in a cost-effective way. When you think about all the different places, just for instance, in the timber industry, our resins go into plywood, LVL, OSB, particle board, MDF, lamb beams, I-beams, doors, windows, you name it. If you're purchasing something that has adhesives in it to build a home or you're buying a home, uh, of course, it's going to have lots of adhesives in it. They're they're very very uh, sustainable and very, I would say, safe. Uh, so there's about a 60 to 70 percent chance that the material in your uh, home are going to have Exion resin in it. And then with regards to wood power poles, we can even protect steel poles, cement poles. Why would you do that? Steel breaks down at around starting at 600 C. Uh, cement starts to spall and blow up a little bit from the moisture in it uh, when they're when they're getting exposed to fires, that kind of thing. But mainly it's on wood power poles. And you can see some of our long-term partners on the right, and the list is huge. But uh, again, it's a very, very fun place to work. And uh, senior leadership does support innovation and sustainable innovation. Go ahead, Adam. 
it, in the introduction of armed wildfire shield, it is heat tri triggered protection. Protection. They call it a smart material, and actually, it is. It's an expandable graphite system. It's not rocket science, but our formulation is quite close to rocket science, I would guess. It's a wet formula that goes on a four foot wide fiberglass mesh that's incredibly strong, thousands of microfibers. It starts out white and then we run it through a dip tank into an automated drying system. We started with two manual lines, then four, then six, and then designed and built the auto line that's currently running in Portland, Oregon. And we will be starting up the second auto line in Missoula, Montana on one of our uh, resin plant campuses in just the next 30 days. So we'll we'll have ample material to basically supply anything in North America and reaching out to Australia, New Zealand, South America, and Africa as well. It activates within 20 seconds when in contact with wildfire. I, I mentioned the fact that it right around 385 F, it starts to activate. When you compare that picture right behind me in my background or which is the same picture on the right-hand side of this uh, slide, it swells around and insulate the pole. It prevents it from burning. There's literally no strength loss or pole failure. And it withstands temperatures up to 2,100 degrees F for 10 minutes at a nine inch distance. The, the head of Cal Fire, when he caught onto this, actually asked us to do a double burn consecutively with a 10 minute hold in between the burns and in fact, we took it another step and went for 30 minutes at 2,100 degrees F at nine inch distance. And there was no strength loss and no charring. So you can see the thickness of the, the activation on the right hand side picture. And in the, in the one with the flame coming out the tower, that's actually at Southwest Research Institute. That's a 26 foot pole double wrapped with uh, armor built, we even did single wrap ones that passed fine. But anyway, the most utilities double wrap for uh, redundancy and just the insurance of their poles performing and not tipping over. Why do they do that? They do not want a pole tipping over like happened in Paradise, California. Two went down right below the town. One went down just above the town. There was only one road in and one road out and 85 people lost their lives. That was in 2018, horrible, horrible situation. But that said, these poles will not tipped over if they were protected. And I'm sad to say that I, you know, we wish we were out there a few years sooner. We started commercialization of this product in basically early 2020. Uh, the invention and commercialization piece and all the third party testing and internal efficacy testing took put a lot of it in 2019, getting it ready. Uh, but you can see the wood uh, underneath the activated armor built right there on the right. It's not even sunburned. And that's the whole idea. You know, you're talking about 2,100 degrees Fahrenheit, five eighths of an inch from the actual wood. And what it, what causes that is the density of that activated layer, keeping the VTU or heat to get to the wood and destroy it. Go ahead, Adam. Here's some of the la uh, in in-house lab testing. We use a three-panel burner, but as you as you can tell from the third-party tower that we use at Southwest Research, that's what they do. Uh, what draw draw your attention to the green line versus the red line, and what you'll see is literally about a little over 500 degrees Celsius delta between the protected and unprotected pole section. This happens to be a southern yellow pine uh, pole section, one of the <laughs> more volatile uh, systems out there in terms of treating wood power poles. And uh, that's the unprotected on the picture where it says test set up 120,000 BTUs. That's how much heat we're applying to that at a nine inch distance. And then the unprotected uh, pole in the middle, it just sat there and charred and basically turned into you know, burnt carbon uh, unprotected. And then the far right picture is the picture and it's got the thermocouples we had just underneath the armor built right at the interface of the pole section that developed that green line. And we barely tickled about 297 C at the end of 10 minutes, 2100 F 
at nine inch distance. So you can see the pole is undamaged. And as, as we go through these slides, you'll, you'll see some of the stuff we did with the canyon burns called the Work Fires Wildfire Interpretive Research Center. Go ahead, Matt, or Adam. This is also a third party test we did at uh, Western Fire in Kelso, Washington. And uh, it goes for 10 minutes, a little bit different setup. They not only have the ring of fire at the base of the wrapped pole, uh, they also have I think, a large wall of these uh, heat, <laughs> heat panels that are putting out about 1950F uh, as they go. And it, that's a full 10 minute test as well. So we definitely went out there and got uh, a few third party certifications for the proposed wildfire simulation test. Go ahead, Adam. We're gonna play you a little video about applying this to poles in the vertical. This won't take very long. To ensure Hexion's armor-built wildfire shield protects wooden utility poles from fire, it must be properly installed. For wooden poles already in service, follow these steps to install armor-built wildfire shield. Start by gathering your tools. Along with the usual safety gloves and eye protection used when working on poles, you'll need a tape measure, utility knife with a sharp blade, a wire brush, and a hammer or nail gun. You'll also need electro-galvanized roofing nails with a 7 16 diameter head or long stainless steel staples, each a minimum of one and one half inches. To prepare the pole, dig down six to 12 inches and clean the exposed pole surface of any loose dirt or debris with a wire brush. This will ensure protection of the pole from fire at the ground line. Flames reach significantly higher than the fuel source, so you'll need to determine the highest point of the application by measuring a minimum of three times the height of the expected fuel source, then marking that point. To cut armor-built wildfire shield to size, measure the circumference of the pole, adding three to four inches for overlap. Use your knife or shears to cut the mesh. Starting six to 12 inches below grade, Wrap the mesh around the pole. Use your fasteners to secure it, placing galvanized nails or staples every four inches on the horizontal seams. On the vertical seams, use two rows of fasteners, four inches apart, staggering the rows to ensure the fastener engages the vertical seam every two inches. The outer row of fasteners should be one inch back from the outer edge of the overlap. The goal is to trap as much of the fiberglass backer as possible to protect against high winds. Additionally, take care to ensure fastener heads are not overdriven to prevent the fiberglass mesh from being cut in service. As you work your way up the pole, overlap each section by two inches. A second layer of wrap can be applied for added protection. To install the second layer, follow the same procedures, making sure to offset the vertical seams by at least four inches. Double check that the wrap is secure, adding fasteners as needed. Then backfill the hole to complete the job. The wooden utility pole is now protected against wildfires. When it comes time for pole inspection, you can cut a flap to expose the pole surface. After inspection, the flap can be re-secured using galvanized roofing nails or stainless steel staples. If the armor-built wrap ever becomes damaged in service, cut a patch of new material with a three-inch overlap in all directions beyond the damaged area and attach the patch using the vertical seam two-row fastener pattern. The top and bottom circumference of the patch must also be nailed or stapled. If you have any questions regarding the proper installation or reinstallation of Armor Built Wildfire Shield, you can reach our global customer service network by emailing service at hexion.com or calling 1-888-443-9466. Interesting, and thank you for uh, walking through that with us. There's a lot of folks out there now starting to wrap what they call in situ uh, with the poles in situation. And uh, that said, I mean, it's really talking about wrapping poles that are already in the vertical. And what we're really after there is that the top of the wrap is basically at least three times the height of the fuel load uh, in, in the area that you know could have the wildfire. So that's kind of how that works. And the, we, we've been to several of the linemen rodeo. I, I'm so impressed 
that these folks train and train and train and they're very safety focused. It's really quite amazing. Uh, this gentleman here, he came down, there was a few of them that climbed it and uh, said that he really, really liked how his gaff felt, gaffs felt going up the uh, wrap pole. Very, very sturdy. And just to that point, we've got a little video later on, but this wrap is so strong that with a single gaff, uh, completely unsupported by wood. In other words, if, if a lineman stuck their gaff in a wide check and only the armor built wrap was holding their gaff, it will hold north of 500 pounds on a single gaff. We, we literally couldn't rip it. In fact, we had a an air cylinder with a gaff on it pushing in the routed area that you'll see later. And we it ripped maybe about a half inch and just loaded up and stopped and the uh, gauge wouldn't go any higher than 500 pounds. So I'm not quite sure exactly what it would hold, but uh, at the Lyman Rodeo where we've had these wrap poles for climbing, they really enjoyed it, to, said it was very, very safe. Go ahead, Adam. This is a picture on the left. Well, here's, here's Mark Clark, the co-inventor. He's actually got his gaff in the route and the route is on the left. That's literally about an inch and a half deep route in the pole we cut that window so you could see it that's where he's putting his gap and literally jumping up and down on it but as i said we had literally a mechanical cylinder with a gap on it pushing in that same route and it went up to 500 pounds and stopped and we couldn't get it to go any further but uh, it's really pretty amazing and we were really happy to see that uh, that it held that much because for lineman safety and that's what we're talking about today is safety period so you know that's what it's about is these people feeling safe poles not dropping across roads that are single road in and out poles not failing so that the 911 responders have comms available and ingress and egress for people that live around them pretty interesting So in terms of allowing for service and inspection, crews can still conduct routine pole utility inspections. You can do boring tests through it and so forth. It will literally self-heal. When the, when the intumescent or the material activates, this is unactivated material to the right in the picture. That's just at rest and they cut a little flap. You can drill holes through it. You can cut it easily with a razor knife, open up the flat, flap, get it out of your way, do your bore holes. Osmos, other other companies that do that kind of stuff uh, are very happy with it. In fact, Osmos is, a, is a marketing armor built as well. Our partner is Stella Jones, the largest wood power pole producer uh, in North America. We basically run our armor built through them. They wrap a lot of poles in the horizontal for their customers that request it. And uh, then there are lots and lots of customers that are wrapping in the vertical. And like I said, most all of them do a double wrap, some do single, and you can go out ahead of a fire where you think poles might get exposed and do a single wrap or double wrap, either one. It's really quite fast. You can use battery operated nail guns, battery operated uh, staple guns. It's really quite fast. If you're gonna go down and dirty just quick on a, you know, ahead of a fire line, very effective. If you can get it up there about, you know, just three times the height of the fuel load, you're good to go. This is, of course, talking about repairing damage. If I'm being honest, that, that little, uh, I did that with a claw hammer when we were there, and then the gentleman uh, put a patch over it. That probably would have self-healed right over the top of that. But just for insurance sake, we talked about putting the patch right over that damaged area. This really would denote the fact that another pole rubbed on it or some type of equipment rubbed it or caught it or a tractor or what have you out there in the world. There's lots of poles and wheat fields and row croppers and stuff like that. And they do run into them once in a while and do some damage. So it's easy to patch. You know, if you have some armor built with you, you just cut it about three inches top and bottom and around the pole, staple it on there, nail it on there and off you go. It's really quite effective. Go ahead, Adam. This is a pole on the left that actually went through the mes recent mosquito fire. 
in California. If you'll notice in the background of that pole, that's a gentleman taking a picture of a gentleman <laughs> taking a picture with his cell phone. But there is three vehicles just below the pole, about 25 feet down the hill, and they are completely burned out. In fact, it got so hot that the aluminum wheels on both of those vehicles were melted. And there's an RV between the two vehicles, and the pole is basically the only thing left standing in that area. And it had armor built on it, double wrap, and uh, there was, <laughs> the, we didn't get a picture of, of the reveal, but I'll show you what some looks like. In the middle, you're looking at a brush away. We, we torched this pole on purpose just to show what it looks like. We brushed off the activation. You can literally wrap right over the top of armor built after it's activated, just brush off the carbon. It's completely environmentally safe. There's no harmful VOCs when using it. There's nothing harmful, harmful for the environment. And we have uh, end of life documents for it. Uh, we have all the testing materials that we've uh, developed. In fact, it's been through a quantitative ultraviolet system for north of 45 years. And what that means is we had lots and lots of sections of arm built in, in QUV chambers. And we also have them down in Arizona to the wind applications, but it literally uh, gets it wet uh, like three times a day, then it dries it super hot. <laughs> it, it's pretty heinous, but uh, one week in the QUV chamber is equal to about 17 weeks to the wind or out in the world. And so with a pole life being in that 50 to 70 year range likely, that's what we're after. We, we basically ran out of samples testing it uh, each, we did it each month and then each quarter. And then uh, anyway, we got out there past 45 years and shut that off. But there you go. And that's what it looks like. It's really pretty black so you can tell when it's on there. Yeah, and you can wrap right over the top of it. Thank you, Adam. Now, when you think about the, the Wildfire Interpretive Research uh, Center Canyon Burns, we partnered with Cal Fire, who does these prescribed burns. These particular burns uh, that were done were about a thousand acres each or a little more uh, in the Gallatin Ranch, just outside Salinas, California. And we partnered with Pacific uh, Gas and Electric, Stella Jones Corporation, the National Science Foundation, and San Jose State University. And they had lots and lots of monitoring equipment we had eight poles in uh, two of these fires. Uh, uh, block two had four poles and the canyon burn, which you're looking at right there, had four poles in it wrapped. Uh, I think five or six of eight poles were intermessed all the way to the tip. And when you think about the canyon effect, heat goes really high. I mean, these flames were jumping anywhere from 20 to 30 meters or 20 to 30 yards high. But now that said, it's all about duration and fuel load as well. But it was a great group of people to work with. Some of the largest prescribed burns in North America that were done. And it only like jumped the area maybe twice. And they had a couple of helicopters on scene, one to start fires and one to put fires out where they weren't supposed to be. And uh, they used both. But uh, it was really pretty epic to be there and watch, and we were quite happy with the results. Go ahead, Adam. This pole on the left is before the burn. It was pole number one in block two, and that is a pole that is double wrapped, and you can see the marine oak just to the background of it. It's on a little bit more of a slope than you can tell. This, the picture in the middle is post-burn, and that particular pole hit about 1,940 degrees. And you can see that the inside of the first layer was not even activated. That's about a five eighths of an inch thick insulation around the pole. When that fire hit, we had eight thermocouples on each pole, three outside the pole to the wind and five underneath all at different heights. And so that's how we know what the temperatures were. And you can see by the wood in the reveal after the burn, inside layer not activated, insulation effective, the wood is not even sunburned. The 
head of Cal Fire, Bryce Minder, who was there running these burns, he said, you know, Scott, these, he said, this stuff is amazing. He said, I, I had no idea that with that density of insulation, you could literally protect the wood from that much heat and only be five eighths of an inch away. And so that was, that was quite a validating comment that he made. Pretty epic, really. I mean, scorched earth. So the main thing here is to get to your questions, and I, I hope there are some. It looks like there's 13 uh, chat, chats there, but anyway, let's do yes. some questions. Yeah, thanks very much uh, for the presentation. Excellent job. Uh, first, first question is from Peter uh, Nicholas. How many wrap pull sections have encountered a non-passive experience with a wildfire and survived? Oh gosh. Oh, in that 15 to 20 range. Yeah, in that 15 to 20 range. Yeah, I mean, it's just inevitable with basically three decades of drought and not much uh, fuel mitigation in the forest and, you know, uh, chaparral, grass, all that stuff. And again, these are mainly west of the continental divide, but as many as are out there now, I know I've got pictures of at least a dozen, but I think it's in that uh, 15 to 20 range that have been through the fires. Another question, what is the comparative cost of wrapping these poles as opposed to replacing the distribution? Yeah, On yeah, yeah, good question, whoever asked that. It can be anywhere from fifteen to uh, thirty thousand dollars to replace a pole in service. I mean, that seems shocking to me uh, when I first heard those numbers, but it was validated by the lead engineer at PG&E. He said, "Oh no, when you send linemen, linemen out there uh, with equipment and so forth, and taking down lines, taking down service, uh, bringing a pole with you, getting the poles extracted that are damaged." Uh, versus putting arm build on there, even double wrapped. And some utilities double wrap it all the way to the tip. And when you look at this presentation that's being sent to you, the one I just went through, it even has a, what we call an armor top on it, which is water impervious. It's backed with a 40 mil butyl on the underside of the uh, armor build. Now that said, armor build from one foot below ground line all the way to the tip is anywhere from a few to several hundred dollars. So it's it's really de minimis when you think about replacing the pole versus just <laughs> wiping off the carbon uh, activation and just wrapping over the top of it. And you don't even have to be in that big of a hurry because the fuel load that was there will take at least a few years to grow back and be of any concern to anybody. Great question. Okay. Well, that's it. Okay. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you for the questions.